Welcome back. You're still watching The Globe on the SABC News Channel. And it's a story that's shocked many across the world, certainly on our continent. And that's the passing of uh, Jerry Rawlings, uh, former president of Ghana. And we continue to take a look at the legacy of this former president, uh, uh, John J. Rawlings. And we're now joined via Zoom by the director at the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conversation at the University of Johannesburg, Professor Adekeye Adebajo. Thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to the program. Good evening, Peter. Thank you. All right, so Jerry Rawlings, um, we've been speaking to someone in Ghana and a country, yes, definitely in mourning as one expects, but he was a Pan-African uh, character as well, wasn't he? Absolutely. I think one of his great legacies will be peacemaking. And not many people realize how instrumental he was in the peacemaking in Liberia in the 1990s. Uh, he was chairman of the Economic Community of West African States for a year, and he basically bridged the gap between Nigeria and the most powerful Liberian warlord, Charles Taylor, through two conferences in Akosombo and Accra between 94 and 95. And I described him as the Pied Piper of Accra because it was him that called the diplomatic tunes to which many of the warlords and political actors uh, basically followed in that particular peace process. So I think he was absolutely key. Why do you think he had this ability to, to get to some difficult uh, scenarios and find solutions? Well, he was very pragmatic. And I think we mustn't forget that he's the longest ruling leader in Ghana's history. He was there for 20 years, first as a civilian, first as a military, rather, ruler, as a man on horseback for a decade, and then for the second two decades as a civilian, democratically elected leader who basically gave birth to Ghana's multi-party elections. And at the beginning, he started off with a very radical leftist group. And there were populists, there were defense committees, etc. And he tried to mobilize market women, etc. He saw that those policies were not working. And within two years, turned to the World Bank and IMF. And he basically adopted a lot of the privatization measures that they wanted and he became the darling of Western donors, basically getting about $800 million, $900 million in loans uh, by the end of the 1980s. And he used some of this money for rural electrification, for subsidizing farmers, and that helped him in turn to get elected in 1992 and 1996. So he was quite pragmatic, although in his foreign policy, he remained quite pan-Africanist. He was, of course, very close ideologically to Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso in the 1980s, and they were fellow travelers. He also had a very close relationship with Muammar Gaddafi, which was quite strange, and Libya had investments in Ghana. And, of course, he was close to Cuba's Fidel Castro, as Nelson Mandela was. So he was a very interesting character. And one thing I just want to mention, Peter, that's absolutely critical about Rawlings is that he very much saw himself as continuing the legacy of the one of the greatest Pan-Africanists, which is Kwame Nkrumah, mm -hmm. the founding president of Ghana. And so a lot of his early socialist ideas uh, were from Nkrumah, trying to mobilize people, trying to focus on development, and in 1992, in one of the most impressive acts of national restitution, he actually built a bronze statue to Kwame Nkrumah in Independence Square and restored his image, which had been very badly tarnished when Nkrumah was toppled mm -hmm. from power in 1966. So he was an heir of Nkrumah. You know, some people might judge him on some of the political choices that he made, but, you know, I'm always, uh, I always remember that it, actually he was an Air Force pilot, uh, he wasn't a trained politician, and he almost had to learn on the job. 
Absolutely. Um, this is part of his resourcefulness. Of course, he was very well trained in that he went to Achimota College, which is the kind of Eton of Ghana, where uh, Kwame Nkrumah and Kofi Annan, the late United Nations Secretary General, also studied. So he had a very solid foundation. But in the early days, between 1979 and 1981, he practically spent all of his time with Marxist academics at the University of Ghana in Legon. And so he learned and kind of improved himself, but he was pragmatic enough to change course when he saw that, you know, the treasury was bare and the leftist policies were not working. One gets a sense that, um, again, despite not always getting it right, he always had his heart on his country, his people and the continent. Yes, I, I think uh, Rawlins' legacy will be largely positive. And he was so popular in Ghana. I mean, imagine a leader being in power for two decades. And still, if he could have run in the elections in 2000, many people believe that he would have won. And after leaving power, he was also the African Union Special Envoy in Somalia. So he continued to serve the continent. But I think, Peter, it's also important to balance all this praise with some of the human rights abuses that happened under his regime. We know that three previous military heads of state were assassinated in 1979, along with five others. And three Supreme Court justices were also uh, killed in 1981 and some other military officers. And so there were excesses and the system wasn't an open liberal one with a free press and free democratic system. But I think it improved gradually over time so that, you know, in 1992, turnout was 50 percent for the elections. Four years later, they were up to about 70 percent. And the system was gradually more opened up so that other parties could have access to the media and other parties could campaign more freely. So I think it's important to balance the record. So what do you think? Because um, I, I, I met him uh, years after he uh, retired from, from active politics. And I got a sense that he had a lot of things that he would have loved to have still done. And I guess he had wisdom with hindsight. And I just wonder, from the, 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 the Jerry Rawlings that you know, what would his message be for the continent at this time? I, I also met him, uh, Peter, at mm. a, a conference organized by the African Union in Cairo, I think around 2015, somewhere around there. Um, he was very committed to the continent. And one of the legacies, I think his greatest legacy, will be in terms of the multi-party system that has been established in Ghana. Ghana is one of the most consolidated um, democracies on the continent. And you've had ruling parties twice lose power and give up power. Mm. And I noticed that uh, Rawlins was very active on Twitter and actually congratulated Joseph Biden. So I think there are lessons from Ghana for the U.S. and what's currently going on in terms of peaceful transitions of power from one party to another. All right. Professor Adebajo, thank you so much indeed for your time this evening and uh, helping us uh, to reflect on uh, Jerry Rawlings' life. Thank you so much. Thank you, Peter. Thanks. All right. That's uh, Professor Adekeye Adebajo from the University of uh, Johannesburg, who's uh, director at the Institute for Pan-African Thought and Conversation. All right, so we're going to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we'll come back to Ghanaians living here in Johannesburg and get a sense of how they're feeling and the sad news of the passing of Jerry Rawlings. Stay with us.